my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. (laughs) I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place to come together and share childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Aeroflow Breast Pumps. Aeroflow has helped millions of new and expecting parents discover the breastfeeding and postpartum essentials covered by their insurance, including breast pumps, maternity compression, and lactation education and support. They take care of everything, including all paperwork, working with your insurance company, and explaining your options to get these free essentials. Aeroflow offers all major breast pump brands, including Medela, Spectra, Motif, Lansano, Amida, LV, Willow, and more. All you have to do is go to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour and fill out their free and easy qualify through insurance form. Extra bonus, if you use the coupon code birthhour15 in their online shop, you'll get 15% off all supplies and accessories. Head over to Aeroflow Breast Pumps dot com slash birth hour to get started. Before we get to today's birth story, I want to talk a little bit about our online childbirth course. It's called Know Your Options. And this is the course you've been looking for if you just have that gut feeling that you know you should be taking a childbirth course, but maybe the one that's being offered to you by your care provider is not exactly what you're looking for. It might be more catered towards the type of birth they want you to have versus making you informed of all your different options and how to address different things that happen in birth. Because as this podcast has shown us, birth is very unpredictable. So we would love to have you check out our 12 module course. You can go to thebirthhour.com slash course to see detailed outlines of what is included in the course. You will also get a bonus course called Beyond the First Latch that is an additional six modules all about pumping, feeding your baby, going back to paid work if that's part of your plan. And we have a special coupon code for you. It's 100OFF for $100 off enrollment. Again, that's thebirthhour.com slash course. All right. Today's episode is a rebroadcast. We're going to have a batch of replays this summer as we take a little bit of a summer break to spend time with our kids. And if you haven't listened to the podcast very long, they'll probably be new to you anyways, because the podcast dates back to 2015. So we're pulling some episodes from our archives And you can always access all of those archived episodes via our Patreon page. So the most recent 100 episodes are always free in your main podcast feed. But then if you want to access over 600 additional birth stories, you can head over to patreon.com slash birth hour and access those for as little as $1 a month. Today's birth story guest is Amber, and she's going to be sharing two birth stories. The first one, a hospital birth that had a traumatic ending and her journey to seeking a fear-free and redemptive birth at a birth center with her second birth. Hi, Amber. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for being here today. Thank you for having me, Bryn. Can you start by telling listeners a little bit about you and your family? My name is Amber Keeler. And my husband's name is Nathan, and we live in Middle Tennessee with our two daughters, Vienna and Lydia, and our dog, Radner. Great. And we're going to hear both birth stories today. So let's go back to your first pregnancy and finding out you were pregnant and how the pregnancy went. Yeah. So my first pregnancy was a bit of a surprise, a happy surprise. I had been on the pill and I've been married for about seven months when we found out we were pregnant and I lost that first pregnancy. Um, it's called a chemical pregnancy. I hate that term because I feel like it doesn't really validate the loss. But after we lost that first pregnancy on the pill, I immediately got off the pill because I just wanted to try a more natural approach to family planning. I had heard that There was a possibility that the pill could allow an egg to get fertilized, but then not create a condition where the fertilized egg could implant in the womb. So I just wanted to use natural planning um, so that if any eggs got fertilized, they would, you know, be able to implant and not be terminated. Um, So people say natural family planning, they call those people parents. (laughs) And sure enough, we got pregnant 10 days off the pill, and we genuinely like were not trying to get pregnant, but we did. And so, um, yeah, we were really excited and just ran with it. So 
I ended up going with um, the Vanderbilt midwives here in Nashville because at the hospital, Vanderbilt Hospital, they have a room with a birth tub, a water tub. And I knew that you can't necessarily like deliver the baby there in the water, but you could labor. And that sounded really good to me. So everything in the pregnancy was perfect. It was just super easy. I didn't have a lot of nausea, which was awesome. I do remember having like intense fatigue, like knock you out on your butt, like sleeping until noon kind of fatigue. But other than that, the pregnancy was awesome. It's the luxury of the first pregnancy, right? Is you can sleep till noon. (laughs) Oh, yeah, right? (laughs) I know. Uh Uh-huh. Very, very true. And uh, and yeah, so I did a lot. (laughs) I was teaching homeschool at the time. And uh, that's actually how I first knew that I was pregnant because for like several days in a row, I felt kind of guilty because I was, my husband would call me and be like, hey, babe, how's your day gone? I'm like, um... It's like 1.30 and I've been awake for 10 minutes. <laughs> so great. <laughs> That's <Yeah>. funny. <laughs> so your pregnancy went well, aside from a little bit of fatigue. Um, how was your prenatal care? My prenatal care was, you know, it was good. I really enjoyed the midwives and I just felt like for the most part, yes, it was clinical. Now looking back and, and kind of having experienced something different with my second I look back, I see, yeah, it was clinical, but they were so nice and really helpful. If I had any questions, they would answer them. Um, I think the hardest part now looking back is realizing that oftentimes, especially for first-time moms, you don't know what questions to ask until you really start doing the research and digging in on your own. And I kind of just went into it thinking, oh, they'll tell me what questions to ask, and they won't, not really. You kind of have to do that work yourself. So my birth story with my daughter, Vienna, we had not found out what her gender was. We wanted to be surprised on that. So I went into labor at about 4.30 a.m. and uh, was really excited. There's just nothing like the first time you get to wake up your husband and tell him, I think I'm in labor. Um, so that was really awesome. Uh, he His eyes just got like huge and um, we were just so excited. And we did what, you know, any young, uh, still crazy in love honeymoon phase people do and just had a lot of sex. They were like, well, if, if I'm in labor, let's get this thing going for real. So, and because we didn't have another kid, we just had a lot of sex and laid in bed and watched a lot of Netflix. I think at the time, like Breaking Bad was our binge. So, yep, sitting there in labor and just watching Breaking Bad. And uh, and it was so much fun. Um, I, we just took our time. Things progressed really beautifully, really um, textbook progression. And uh, the whole labor itself lasted about 17 hours. And I was loving laboring at home so much, I did not want to leave, which I was surprised. Like, I was like, you know, let's just push it. Let's just push it. Let's get these uh, contractions as close together as possible before we have to go in. Um, And so I labored in the tub and labored on him. And it was just, uh, it was just really awesome. Like he loved being my support and loved that feeling of me just leaning on him and and just looking to him to be my strength. And it was really great just for our relationship, our marriage. It was really special. So around, uh, I guess around 2.30 that afternoon, we finally decided, okay, let's head in. So we headed in. First, we went to the midwife's office and she checked me and she said, yep, you are five centimeters, 100% effaced, and congratulations, you're having a baby today. So that was, you know, obviously very exciting. I just remember from there, I had this big blue birth ball that I would carry with me and my husband had all of our bags. So from there, we went straight to Vanderbilt Hospital and we parked in the garage and making our way through like any time a wave would hit me. And I call waves, I call contractions waves now. Um, so I might switch back and forth between contractions and waves, but anytime a wave would hit me, I'd stop wherever I was, even like in the middle of the parking garage and sit on my ball and just rock back and forth. And my thing with that first birth that I would just go, 
yes, or relax. <laughs> like my husband still makes fun of me now. Anytime there's like a stressful situation, he'll go, relax. <laughs> and so, uh, but poor him, he was like, uh, loaded down like a mule with all of our bags and I would just stop leaving him standing there carrying all this weight. Um, but it was still, it was so much fun. I just was so giddy. I remember walking through the halls and stopping on my ball and singing through the contractions and chanting my yes and my relax and just people cheering me on in the hallway, like go girl. And just feeling like this is awesome. Like what an incredible experience to get to go through in life and with my man. And so um, the midwife that was on call at the time, her name was Annie, and she was amazing. We clicked so sweetly, and um, man, we just rocked it. I just, I loved her so much. And she was with us, helped us get the room ready. We did get the room with the tub, which I was really excited about. We made our way into the room when the room was finally ready, and I do remember around, I would say it was probably about 5 or 6 p.m. at this point, and um, the waves got like way intense, and I I was probably starting to enter transition, um, or at least very active labor, and um, I immediately, once we were in the room, I just tore off my clothes, and um, I just wanted straight in that water. And I do remember it helped. It's just very comforting. Being in that warm water, it was just very comforting. Um, I did end up asking for a volunteer doula to show up, and her name was Amber, same name as mine. And I was nervous about having a stranger there, but I don't know, her eyes were just so reassuring. And I just remember she just had this very peaceful spirit about her. And so... Yeah, I really, really enjoyed having her there, and it was a really good thing that we did end up getting her too, because right when I was in transition in the tub, like the peak intensity of labor, um, my beloved midwife, Annie, her shift ended at seven, and a new midwife came in, and um, there was only one midwife in all of my prenatal appointments that really rubbed me wrong at Vanderbilt, and... um, I had shared with my husband as soon as I left the appointment, I called him. I was like, babe, I don't think she liked me. I just really got the vibe that she didn't like me. And um, and I just didn't feel like warm feelings from her at all. And um, it seemed like I was annoying to her. And so I was like, I just really, really hope that she's not there on call that night. And I, there were so many midwives on my team. I'm like, there's no way. Sure enough, she was the midwife who walked in when Annie's shift ended in the middle of transition. And man, that just popped my bubble so hard. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I I just got this really huge wave of anxiety. And it was just this feeling of, you know, what are the chances? And uh uh-oh, I just had a bad feeling going forward. So thankfully, my doula, Amber, brought these little LED tea light candles. And this is where now, again, looking back, especially I am a doula now, but looking back, I'm like, wow, I did not prepare myself at all for any real coping uh, techniques or tools. And so I was just like, I remember I had the mindset at the time of um, like, my body knows how to poop. My body knows how to push out a baby. Like, they're one and the same, but they're really not. And so, um, thankfully, she had some tools with her. So, she pulled out her LED candle, and I remember looking into that flame and just really liking that. I also remember that um, I really liked having the water um, sprayed on my back. And that um, eventually, though, in the tub, it got really hot. And I, at the peak of of transition, the midwife that I really didn't like walked in, and I just remember feeling like there I'm about to die. <laughs> like that that thought that you hear women having of, surely I am dying right now and will not survive this. That was a very real thing, and it felt like the intensity of the wave was like absolutely like about to like expel all of my insides. And I, that's really graphic, but that's, that's what I remember processing what I was feeling as. And, um, so with the, 
the hot air like around my face. I think the only time I really yelled at my husband, he had gotten close to me to to just love on me. And I was like, get out of my face. I can't breathe. I'm going to throw up. And he was like, it's okay. <laughs> okay. So he went and he, he got me these little uh, organic honey candies and he got a little a candy for me to suck on and kept offering me water and and just got out of my face. And that, and that was good. Um, I do remember my doula at one point looked at me and she said, Amber, because I was like, I, I can't do it any longer. I can't do it. I was like, please check me. Please check me. Because I had, I thought like, there's, I'm probably not making any progress. I probably reverted back to two centimeters and I'm going to be doing this for the next 10 days. And uh, I was like, there's no way I can't do it. I was like, and this is where I was like, please, I just need an epidural, please. I was like begging at this point. And my doula looked at me and she was like, Amber, you can do it. She was like, you don't need an epidural. I promise you don't need one. She was like, why don't you just try to rest? And the idea of trying to rest, I was like, oh, I can do that? Um, So I did. I laid back in the tub. And the next thing I know, I drifted off. And when I woke up, to me, it felt like it had only been like maybe 10 seconds before the next contraction hit and I was back in it. But I later found out that I had like taken a 15 minute nap and that like was shocking, but it was awesome. And I felt like that little nap just gave me the energy that I needed to go from there. So once I woke up from the nap, I had like one more contraction in the tub. And then my, I was like, I got to get out of this tub. It's just too hot. And so I got out, my doula walked me, um, to the bathroom. She was like, why don't you sit down and pee? Um, I think you're going to, your baby's going to be coming here soon. So I sat down on the toilet and, um, that's where I really remember breaking through like mentally. And, um, my doula just locked eyes with me when the next, uh, wave hit. And she did this thing I now know is called guided breathing. And she kept eye contact with me and she just used her hand to just gently like guide me through breathing in and breathing out and these like long, slow, deep breaths. And, you know, she had just had so much peace in her eyes, like no anxiety, total calm. And so, you know, a woman in labor is like an emotional sponge, right? So I just like absorbed all of her peaceful energy. And I remember when that wave hit and using that guided breathing, all of a sudden it like didn't hurt. It was intense, but I wasn't freaking out about it. I wasn't afraid of it. Um, and because I wasn't afraid of it, it's like all of a sudden I didn't process it as pain. So it was really awesome. When I got up from the toilet, I, I was pretty freaked out though. I looked down and my water bags were like bulging out of my body. And it was like this alien, creepy, scary thing. It was so bloody and just like hanging out. And I was like, uh, uh, what do I do? And, uh, my midwife actually said, go ahead and sit back down on the toilet. So I sat back down and you could um, see over your belly to see that? Amazingly, I have a really tiny belly oh, in, okay. in pregnancy. Yeah. <laughs> I was so like, I, I definitely could not see that without a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For the most part, like I was even like, you know, shaven uh, up to like nine months. So yeah, wow. I could I could I could do some stretching and kind of see things <laughs> there towards the end. It was not as 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 a uh, viewable with the second pregnancy, I did get a little bit bigger. I wasn't able to shave there at the end, but yeah, I, I tend to have tiny babies, um, even at full term. So yeah. So after that, um, the water bags like went back in, which I thought was pretty cool. And uh, I walked over to the bed and I was like, at this point still hadn't been checked and just really didn't know where I was at. And I still had that first time mom fear of, oh, I'm surely like back to zero centimeters now and I'm just never going to have this baby and I'm going to be here for the rest of my life until I die. So I just really irrational. (laughs) So I I laid down on the bed and it was so intense. I didn't know what was really happening or how close I was. And so I was like, please, can I just have the nitrous oxide? Like I want it now. I want it now. And just really panicking for it. And so they brought in the nitrous and, um, I remember I took like that first breath of nitrous. I was laying on my side in the bed. I had my leg up and it was like, I've never done acid (laughs) 
or like any like illicit drugs, but I just imagine that that's what it would be like. I felt like I was on another planet and I hated it. I absolutely hated it. I felt like I had been so present for my entire labor up until that point. And then all of a sudden, like I just, I could still feel everything, but my mind wasn't there. I no longer felt very present or powerful or engaged. And, and so, but yet at the same time, I was like too scared to stop breathing it in. So I just kept breathing it and everything from there, from then on happened in about 20 minutes. So it was very fast. I remember the, the water, my water broke and it was just like this big gush and it was kind of a nice relief. But then right after it, broke, there was like this hustle in the room. And again, because I was breathing in this nitrous, I I wasn't very present to understand what was going on. So, and nitrous affects different people differently, but this is how it was affecting me then. Um, It was just confusing and scary. And I was hearing things like, uh, there's meconium in the water, get in the NICU team. Um, And to me, it was just very dramatic. And I suddenly was very afraid for my baby. And, um, you know, my husband was like, you can do it, baby, you can do it. And I then I remember my doula up by my face um, saying, you're doing great, Amber, you're doing great. And I was like, seriously thought I was dying and like transitioning to the afterlife, thanks to the nitrous. And so I'm like making my peace with God and like apparently asked for forgiveness, <laughs> like just had this whole like spiritual um, crossover um, while I'm pushing and uh, and I was like, I just want my baby to be okay. Like, I'll just do anything for my baby. And my midwife, it, things started getting even more panicky. And, and she, she was very panicky. I, I did not like that about her. I just had a high anxiety level with her. And I remember that echoing through my brain as I was pushing, just even the tone of her voice. And so she at one point she said, okay, Amber, if you don't get her out in the next a contraction, I'm going to have to cut you. And that was now, of course, I now looking back as well, I know like, how, why would you ever like use that language? Like say the words, I will have to cut you. Like just, ugh. so um, my husband though did know I did not want an episiotomy and he was down there like seeing everything right there by her and so he spoke up and he was like, she does not want an episiotomy. And I think I don't even know exactly how she responded to him. But um, the next thing I knew, I had that next contraction and um, I pushed really, really hard. And and uh, I was like, this is it. I'm giving everything I've got. I'm getting this baby out right now. I mean, gave it everything I had and she didn't come out. Um, she was crowning though. My husband was describing her hair to me and and so I just didn't know what to think. And and at that point, because she didn't come out, like my midwife said, with that next contraction, I'm expecting, okay, what's next? Brace myself for an episiotomy. Break, you know, brace myself to feel getting cut. And so I, I did. I prepared myself and the next wave hit. And what I felt was an out of this world kind of excruciating pain. And I screamed, like the sound of me screaming haunted me forever. Um, I could not believe, I thought for sure that I had just been ripped from the inside out and that surely, you know, I had no lower body left. That's how intense that pain was. And that was the very moment that my daughter came right out. She came shooting out. Um, I didn't know what happened all I knew, okay, she she's born. I remember I'm still, you know, on the nitrous. So I remember hearing um, her cry. I hear her cry. Okay, she's alive, and that's all that mattered in that moment. So uh, they laid her pretty much right on my chest. They were very respectful about um, my wishes as far as delayed cord clamping. Um, as far as the, the meconium in the water, I heard the midwives. Um, or nurses, someone say um, the meconium's not a problem. And so thankfully they were able to put her right on my stomach and um, my uh, my eyes were like nearly swollen shut from the intensity of pushing, even though I only pushed for 
20 minutes, I I didn't do it very effectively. And so I really wore myself out and my face was so swollen. All my blood vessels were popped. But yeah, she was she was alive. And and I couldn't believe that I was, but I apparently was. And I remember looking down through like these just really swollen, teary eyes and seeing her arm hair. And that was the first thing I actually said after she was born was, she has arm hair. I just remember I couldn't believe, it was just so surprising to see this actual tiny human, like with all of the human features, even down to arm hair that had just come out of me. And uh, again, it was pretty much a blur um, because I was still, I think, coming down off of all of the nitrous that I had breathed for like the last 20 minutes straight. But I remember looking over at my sweet husband, and he he said to me, it's a girl, and he just lost it. And he later told me, he was like, you know, I had to be there for you. I had to be in, like, warrior, soldier, go mode. And so he didn't let himself, like, process any of his emotions during my labor. But then at that moment, it's like it all hit him, and he let himself feel for, like, the first time. And he was just sobbing. He was It was like, my girl's. And, oh, man, I was crying and and I just feeling her warm, slippery body. It was just absolute bliss in that moment. Um, I still felt, like, really traumatized. Um, it was uh, the very strange feeling of, of, like, pain and I'm alive and my baby's here and we're happy. Um, but what happened and... Um, some nurses came by, you know, later and it was, you know, time to deliver the the placenta. And, you know, I remember I, I had some hemorrhaging, so they gave me a shot of Pitocin and then that still didn't work. So then they gave me a, a cytotex suppository and did a lot of massaging on my stomach and that was painful. And I just remember I closed my eyes and I just held my baby girl and I just sang um, terribly, I'm sure, but I sang the way you look tonight and just saying some worship songs. And I remember this guy, this like random dude was sitting on a stool to my left. And at one point he looked at me and he said, you know, that was the most beautiful birth I've ever witnessed. And I remember like, I was like, thank you. But I didn't resonate. Like there was nothing about that birth, especially at the end there that felt beautiful um, it was scary and painful. And what I later found out, then the midwife came back to me and she said, I'm so sorry, Amber, but I'm actually going to have to inspect you rectally. She explained to me what happened there at the end was um, a doctor stepped in and inserted his hand rectally, like into your rectum, and forced your baby's head out to be born fast. Her heart rate was decelerating. She did have the cord wrapped around her twice. And so, yes, this doctor had stepped in and reached his hand into my rectum and literally pushed my baby's head out through my anus, like putting pressure through my rectum to push her out vaginally, if that makes sense. Um, My husband saw it. He was down there when it happened. He was pretty shocked by it. Um, He, again, didn't no, I mean, we're first time parents who didn't really do a lot of research. And I remember being like, what? When she told me that, like, I did do a lot of research into different interventions that were possible. Like I knew about vacuums. I knew about forceps. I knew about episiotomies. Um, I knew what I wanted, didn't want, but never had I ever come across or, you know, been told that a rectal intervention would even be a possibility or something that's even practiced. And I I later joined your your private Facebook page, the Birth Hour um, podcast Facebook page. And I remember after my daughter was born and I had processed it, I finally got the nerve to reach out. And I was like, hey, ladies, so this is my story a little bit. I had this rectal intervention has anyone heard of this happening? And everyone, for the most part, was like, say what? 
I would be so mad. How dare he? What are you? Are you kidding me? He didn't ask your permission. He didn't communicate with you or your husband. Are you kidding me? And oh my gosh, to get that kind of response and uh, validation from that group, it was so healing for me. Um, I will share, I have a history of, um, I was molested as a child. I was about 10 by uh, a boy a little bit older than me. And um, he molested me by basically just using his finger um, into my rectum. And I never discussed that with my midwives or in any part of my you know, prenatal care um, because that was just never brought up. They never asked. You know, it was something from when I was 10 years old. You know, now I'm a grown married woman. I haven't thought about that or, you know, given, yeah, given that any thought in years. So um, to have that done to me without any communication, without any introduction, I just felt so, so violated um, and really traumatized. And obviously when they checked me rectally, what they were checking for was any tearing that was caused from his forceful intervention. Um, thankfully, there there weren't any. T- it wasn't any tearing, but um, it did create some like really bad rectal problems, like really bad hemorrhoids and really bad pain. Um, and I couldn't sit for nearly like a month without like stacks of pillows under me. Um, and so, yeah, that was it. Was really traumatic. Um, after she was born, everything was was pretty much good. We stayed in the hospital for a couple of days, and I remember just telling my story and to my family and being like, "So I'm sorry, but you're never getting any more grandkids um, because I'm never doing that again. I barely made it out with my life the first time, and uh, we'll be adopting if anything." <laughs> so that was my perspective, and um, at that, you know, right after, but after that, and and really reaching out to. Uh, that group of women on your on your Facebook page and getting validation, I was like, okay, you know what? I am going to have an incredible birth again. What I didn't share is that I, 13 months after uh, giving birth to my first daughter, Vienna, uh, we, you know, the, the truth is that you do forget. <laughs> that is a very true thing. You forget all the pain, you forget everything, all the trauma. And you just get baby fever again that can happen. And it did happen, planned this time. And uh, I, at first I was like, okay, I'm going to go into this pregnancy, you know, probably with an epidural maybe. Um, and then after getting that validation um, that, you know, what, what happened to me was not okay, was not normal. I was like, wow, you know what? You're right. And I am going to have, I am not going to be a victim I am going to take complete charge of this birth. I'm going to redeem that first experience. I'm not going to allow myself to be violated. I'm not going to allow put myself in the position where a doctor can step in and do something like that to my body without asking or communicating with me. Like it, it was no longer even I think just about, you know, having a great birth. It was a, a personal victory for me as a woman um, with a past of abuse to be like, I'm not going to be a victim. I'm going to stand up and I'm going to stand up for myself. I'm going to take the reins and I'm going to have an empowered birth. And I'm not going to be done to, I am going to rock this birth myself with my team. And so, man, just this huge fire was lit under me. And so um, that kind of leads me into my second birth story. During my pregnancy with my second, I was just on fire for birth. Um, your podcast was the first thing that I that I would say kind of lit that fire. Um, it was the first thing that I discovered in the birth world and in the kind of like the online birth community. It was the Birth Hour podcast, and I found you um, through following the Lily Jade diaper bags. And, <laughs> I and, love that. Uh, yes. And so I started following you. And I was like, oh my gosh, this exists. There are podcasts with women sharing their birth stories. This is freaking incredible. Because, you know, I did have a kid now. And at the time, like, um, well, we were like doing a house renovation on top of it and like tearing down walls. And it was just super nuts. And 
like so obviously I don't have um, free hands <laughs> like I used to to like sit down and read a book. So the idea of just playing this podcast was like world changing, life changing. So every single day from the time that I discovered you, I listened to a birth hour podcast and a birth story. And it just like, I could not believe the things that I was learning and hearing these women having these different kinds of births and hearing these women share their natural birth stories and, and just the different perspectives on, on birth and the idea that Contractions don't have to be considered pain. You can describe them as pressure and um, the different coping tools, like actually doing real counter pressure and having like sensory distractions and um, just how to have a birth team, like all the things to do. And and I just, I could not, I just ate it up like crazy. And, you know, through then entering that birth world online, I discovered, in addition to that, like the Birthful Podcast, Fear Free Childbirth, the Rockstar Birth Magazine, just like all these different birth resources to have like really empowered birth experiences. And through just diving in and reading and just like, consuming all of that information, I suddenly just felt myself like rising up and just feeling so strong about birth and like really passionate and educated. And it's like all I could talk about for nine months was birth and how incredible it is and how um, it doesn't have to be painful. It doesn't have to be scary. You know, birth is not necessarily, it's not injury. It's not an emergency. Um, you know, things can happen in birth, but a general healthy birth is not something to fear at all. And I began changing my perspective and um, and I, I built this birth team around me. I had my my sisters. I had my two sister-in-laws and then a friend who's basically a sister and my husband and and I had all these tools and everyone I had given everyone their role for a specific reason, like, my friend Molly is like my friend, like a sister. She's my oils girl. So I was like, okay, um, you just bring all your oils, and when I when a wave hits, just put an oil under my nose. And and you know, I heard about aromatherapy being really powerful to um, as a a coping technique during labor. And so um, I had these counter pressure tools and these different sensory balls, like these spiky balls, and then these wood bowls that I wanted used and ice packs and like, um, this icy hot rub that I wanted and just all these different things to try. And I was like, I don't know what I'm necessarily going to want, but here's all the tools that I've learned about that could really help work. And I just want to have them all with us and we'll try them all as we go and we'll find out what feels best in the moment. And so I had this plan set up and from there it was just every day listening to my podcasts and just eating up those birth stories. And then my little birth bubble was popped again <laughs> at 32 weeks when my midwife at Baby and Company, and I will say they were so amazing. Um, the birth center that I ended up going with it was Baby and Company in Nashville. It is literally like a birth spa. I felt like I was getting together with like a bunch of friends anytime I showed up. Um, it did not feel clinical at all. It was so warm and inviting and I just loved it. Um, but yeah, at 32 weeks, um, my midwife was like, well, um, she's in a persistent transverse lie was ended up being the name that I was given. And, um, and she was like, so go to spinningbabies.com and just, Try to do all the techniques that they share to turn your baby. Don't worry. There's still plenty of time. So just start doing all those things. So I did. I went to spinningbabies.com and, and you know, just did started doing all that research. Um, the thing about a transverse lie is that unlike a breach, you can't even attempt a vaginal delivery. Um, if the baby is transverse and you're in labor, um, the only way to ultimately get that baby out is through C-section. 
Um, that's and like again, the most that's, frustrating thing to learn. Like I can oh, just see myself picturing my, my baby in there sideways and being like, oh, yeah. really kid? <laughs> well, and not just picturing it. My midwife ended up helping me like feel the baby and uh-huh. feel what was what. And I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. That's definitely a head right there on like the far side of my hip. <laughs> and like, uh. that's definitely her butt on like the far other side. Fantastic. So, um, I will say I did kind of, even with all that empowering that I was experiencing, like having that news hit me, it was like really deflating. And at that point I hadn't discovered the idea of fear clearing. I did later, but I realized like, okay, I actually kind of have been avoiding birth stories about C-section because that just wasn't going to be me. I was going to have this empowered, redemptive, um, you know, vaginal birth, fear-free, (laughs) pain-free. And now here I am basically being told, do everything you can to turn this baby who's in a persistent sideways lie. But ultimately, if you can't, the only thing that we can do is really, you know, C-section. And so then I just dove into that world, the world of your baby's position. And man, we just did everything we did and we're not like a crazy wealthy family or anything, but you know, I looked at my husband and I was like, baby, please, like, can we just invest in chiropractic and acupuncture and moxibustion? Like, can we just do everything possible to try to turn her? And he agreed, like, yes, absolutely, let's go for it. So I did. Um, I ended up finding an incredible chiropractor who just really believed. I think that was key. She was like, we are going to turn this baby. And she did um, the Rebozo scarf and, you know, walked me through exercises and adjusted my pelvis to get me in good alignment. And, you know, it was really, really frustrating because, you know, every time I went and did something, acupuncture, you know, my husband would burn the mugwort over my toes for like for like 30 minutes at a time and, and you know, just like feeling super crazy, but like whatever, whatever you think will work. Um but we were spending money like week after week and and I because I could feel her position and I knew now what you know what was what she, the the girl wasn't budging and so week after week with everything I was doing she wasn't budging and by 36 weeks my midwife you know needed to schedule me an ultrasound because of her position just to confirm that she was an indeed transverse lie figure out where my placenta was on all that so I went in and man, I've never prayed so hard. I was like, come on, baby, turn, turn, turn. And laying there on the table, um, the ultrasound technician, you know, checking me out. She's like, yep, she's just laying in a hammock across your pelvis. She is super transverse. Like it was exciting. <laughs> and, and I was just so devastated. And, you know, as soon as she left the room, I just busted into tears. And I was like, okay, you know what? It's okay. And that's when I really discovered the idea of fear clearing. And I think her name is Alexa Leachman. She has that fear clearing podcast. Um, I really dove into, okay, you know what? I am going to have the most empowered gentle C-section that's ever been had in the history of C-sections and just really embrace that. I still was continuing to do everything to turn my baby, but now I just shifted my perspective. I cleared the fear. And I was like, you know what? I love C-sections because they can help save transverse babies and it's going to be awesome. And I'm just, it's going to be so empowering. And I'm just going to be able to relate to pregnant women all that much more because I will have had a C-section. And so I, all of a sudden I lost that anxiety. And, um, and then of course I went in for my 37 week checkup and, um, I just, because we had just had that ultrasound, I just assumed and I could feel where she was, that she was still transverse. So I started talking with my midwife. I was like, okay, so there's this thing called a manual, um, an ECV, which is like a manual version where they would have to check me into Vanderbilt and they would, a doctor would try to turn my baby. It's kind of like a last ditch effort. He would try to manually turn her from the outside of my stomach. Um, because my placenta was anterior, that was a little bit riskier, um, but she was like, "It's you can still go for it. So in that checkup, um, I was like, all right, if I'm going to step foot back in Vanderbilt Hospital, 
I just need to make sure like the doctor who did that rectal intervention is not going to be the one to turn the baby. Um, I don't want, I don't want him anywhere near me. Um, and so she was like, let me do some research. So she left, like got her computer, did some research and made some calls. And she came back to me and she was like, Amber, she was like, look, um, that doctor was a resident and he is no longer even at Vanderbilt. So no worries there. Let's talk through, um, you know, the different, the procedures and, and let's start talking through the possibility of a C-section. I still have faith that your baby might still turn, but if you want to do this version, like, let's talk through it all. I was like, awesome. So we sat there, we started talking through, I had all my questions for a gentle C-section and how I wanted it to go and wanting to know what Vanderbilt's, Vanderbilt's protocols were um, for the version and for C-section, all my options. So we talked through all of that. And at the end of the appointment, she was like, all right, well, let's check your vitals. Started checking my vitals and um, checking the baby's heartbeat. And she goes, hmm. She feels the baby. She goes, Amber, she's head down. And I just, oh man, that just makes me cry again. I just burst into tears. I could not believe it. She was head down and I'm just sitting there sobbing. And I was like, can you check vaginally just to make sure? And she was like, yes. And so she reached in vaginally and she checked and I'm just sobbing. And she was like, yep, there's a good hard head right where we want it, head down. And I was like, so what does this mean? And she said, it means you can go enjoy the rest of your pregnancy in peace and we'll see you when you go into labor. And oh man, I just walked out of that room on cloud nine and there's this bakery in town called Five Daughters Bakery and they have these amazing cronuts that my husband and I are obsessed with. So I went and I bought a cronut and I went to surprise my husband at his job and uh, man, when I told him she's head down because he had been right there, you know, in it with me, we both just started crying and celebrating and it was so incredible. So for the rest of the pregnancy, 37 weeks on, you know, our big thing was disc golf. We are obsessed with disc golf and to try to turn the baby anyway, we had been like walking like five miles or so a day um, with my oldest daughter and to try to just encourage her to go down. And so we just went out that afternoon and it was like the sun was shining and the air had never been so fresh. And I was just high. I was just so high for the rest of the pregnancy. We played a lot of disc golf and just really in, did what she said and enjoyed the rest of the pregnancy in peace. So I ended up um, going into having these like false contractions. Um, I do again now call them waves, but I ended up having these false waves and I had, you know, my birth team on speed dial and every time it was around like 38 ish weeks or 39 ish weeks, um, that I was having these waves in the middle of the night, I would go to bed feeling just fine. And then they would wake me up and it was like these crampy period pains and I'd get all excited. Cause I'm like, Oh, it's happening. It's happening. And then they would fizzle out by morning. And it was so frustrating because then I was like not sleeping at night. And then by the time it was like daytime and I had to parent a toddler, they were gone. And so um, I went through the frustration of that, which was very surprising because my f experience with my first was so different. Um, and so uh, I was just like, okay. Well, all right, well, we're, we're doing this now. Every night I'll be having my birth waves and it won't be the real thing and then they're going to fizzle out by morning. And sure enough, that went on for like over a week. And I had even lost my mucus plug. And with my first um, birth, I lost the mucus plug the night before I went into labor. So you know, when I lost that plug again, I was like, okay, it's really happening. Nope, didn't happen. And so that was pretty frustrating there at the end. Um, eventually I was like, okay, you know what? My husband had this like planned time off and he had to take cause he had saved it for the end of his year. And so he started taking that and I still wasn't, you know, I was 40 weeks, still nothing, you know, into 40 weeks, day one, day two, uh, day three, day four. I think it was like finally like 40 weeks and day six, uh, I started having these birth waves just like I had these crampy birth waves in the middle of the night. And then in the morning, 
they kind of were still there. And so we got really excited and we were like, okay, I think this is the real deal. Let's go play around a disc golf and do some walking. And we did. And sure enough, the waves were like picking up again. And so we were like, oh my gosh, this is, this is it. This is really it. And they were coming closer and closer. So, you know, we called my mother-in-law. We were like, all right, it's really happening this time. They are, you know, a minute long, five five minutes apart. Like, we're going to head into the birth center. So I dropped my uh, oldest off with my mother-in-law. And we headed in. And as soon as we were in the car driving to the birth center, they spaced back out to like 12 minutes apart, like 20 minutes apart. And so I called my midwife because the birth center is like an hour away. I was like, oh no, it's so frustrating. They're spacing back out again. And she was like, it's cool. Just go play disc golf, um, go to dinner. And she was like, just check back in and, and just come in anyway. Come in anyway. Let me take a look at you no matter where they are. So we did. We went and we played disc golf. And sure enough, they picked back up. And this time I was like, all right, I'm not just going to call this. Let's keep going. So we were like a couple of hippies, just me and my husband, like out on the disc golf course. And I'm wearing like this like delivery dress with no underwear, like just because I was like, I have to stop and pee a lot. <laughs> You're just squatting in the field. So, like literally squatting like in the woods, in the field, like throwing a disc and hiding behind a tree. And it was like, it was awesome. And and the, the waves were picking back up to like three minutes. And every time a wave would hit, I'd hang on my husband and we're like swaying and all these like poor, innocent, like, college and high school dudes are probably like, yikes. <laughs> and it's like, we're like walking birth control out on this disc golf course. Um, but you know, finally at like, they were like consistently three minutes apart. And I was like, all right, babe, this is the real deal. Let's get in the car. Let's go have this baby. Um, and what I hadn't shared was that at my like 39 week checkup, I was already three centimeters. So and my I was like super my cervix was super soft and like really effaced and so I was like surely we're having this baby. And so we went in and so excited the midwife who was there I loved all the midwives but there were like two in particular Maddie and Alice and I was like please lord let it be them. And uh, sure enough Maddie was there to greet us and I was like yes. And I was like, I love you. I was like, I was hoping you were going to be here. And so I gave her a big hug. And so she checked me and she was like, well, okay, you are four centimeters, um, but that's okay. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. Because I was really expecting like at least six. And um, she she was like, do you want to do a membrane sweep? I was like, heck yes. So I had done some research, knew that I was totally cool with a membrane sweep so she swept my membranes, which wasn't bad at all. Then she guided me through the mile circuit, which is something that I had already been doing. It helps like get your baby in a good position. So I went through the mile circuit and um, still nothing. It was really awesome though. She was like, you know, if you don't end up prog- progressing as fast as you'd like, she was like, don't worry. You can just crash here. Y'all can sleep here overnight. And it's like their rooms are like literally like a spa, like a hotel spa. Like we couldn't afford a night in that kind of a hotel <laughs> kind of spa. So we were like, awesome. So I'm sitting there doing the mile circuit. We're listening to like our favorite comedian and like watching The Office and just laughing and really enjoying ourselves. And um, But after like an hour of that, um, she was like, you know what? let's get you in the shower. Let's run some hot water over your nipples. Like nipple stimulation can really help, um, you know, just kind of push you over the edge. If you're like right on the edge, it'll just kind of tip you over. I was like, cool. Okay. So I got in the shower and ran the hot water over my nipples and sure enough, holy smokes, like within a minute of that hot water running over my nipples, it was bam, active labor. And the waves were coming every minute and they were like intense and it was awesome. But I was so excited. Um, my husband, after like five or 10 minutes of that, just being really consistent, really intense, really close. He immediately called our birth team. He was like, okay, guys, it's really happening. If you want to be here for it, you better get here now. And at that point it was like nine o'clock and we had arrived to the birth center at like seven. 
we, I just remember sitting on the ball in the shower and I had, I was just finding this groove and I was like, baby, you play DJ for me. So he was like, Mr. DJ. And he pulled up this song. It was Dave Matthews, you and me forever, or whatever it's called. Um, you and me. And it was just like, yes, everything about that song, the lyrics, like sitting there on my ball in the water. It was awesome. I was like, babe, play that song on repeat. So he played that song on repeat. And slowly started to arrive. He already told him, like, when you come in, don't disturb her. Um, just be there. Be ready. So it was going so great, though. Like, I just really found this zone and in the shower. And it was, like, almost too good. And I was like, you know what? This shower is so awesome. I'm going to save it and get out so that if things get really intense, I can go back to it. <laughs> and so I, was, I got out of the shower and put this robe on and so I ended up finding a position out of the shower where I would be like sitting on a birth ball, like at the edge of the bed, but on the floor. And then when a wave would hit, I would like stand up and lean over this peanut ball that was on top of the bed. And I would like rock over this peanut ball. And what was so awesome was that, you know, through like that early, the earlier labor, I was able to like really still communicate, ooh, I like it when you do that. Um, oh no, I don't like that. Or I like this. And so we ended up finding like this really perfect dance where um, a wave would surge over me and I'd squeeze someone's hand and I'd just really squeeze on. And that's how they knew, okay, a wave is about to come. Everyone kind of like in position. And then someone would apply like a lot of counter pressure. And then someone else would like take this rolling ball, like really dig it into my lower back. And, and then they knew like I really liked the essential oil, like ginger underneath my nose, like right when the wave was starting to get uh, reach its peak. And then right when it was at its peak and its most intense point, I loved having like something really cold um, rubbed into my middle back. And so, you know, with every wave, like it was just so peaceful because I felt so supported. And, you know, in between every wave, I just rested. And I was like, literally, my team was like, you were napping for like 10 minutes in between every wave. And neither of my sisters had ever attended a birth before. So they were like, we didn't know what to expect, but it was boring basically because, you know, we just did our thing when a wave would hit and in, and in between you would just sleep. And, um, but it was awesome. It's like, because I knew, I knew with every wave that there was going to be relief and it was going to be, you know, it was going to feel good. Like I was going to have my pressure. Then I was going to have that essential oil that distracted me. And then I was going to have right at the peak, I didn't have to worry because there was going to be something nice and cold at the center of my back. And, um, and so I just was just like in a groove and having fun and really enjoying it. And the other cool thing was that I could pretty much tell when I was going to need to like poop. And so anytime I would like have that feeling, I was like, okay, I'm going to go over to the toilet and sit on the toilet for this next wave. Um, and then when that wave would come, I would just let it all out. I would just push it all out and then be able to like wipe myself and go back to my spot on the bed. Um, which was, I know kind of like silly, but I really enjoyed being able to kind of control that and be modest about pooping and just kind of do it in the toilet. Um, but literally like, so active labor started around nine ish is when like it got intense in the shower and my birth team showed up. And, uh, then like by 12 30, um, I, I was on the bed. We were all doing our thing. And my midwife was like, Amber, do you mind if I check you? Um, she was like, you're sounding a little pushy. And I was like, sure, go ahead. And so she checked me and she came back to my face. Like I had a wave, everyone did their thing. The wave passed and she looked at me and she goes, Amber, she's like, you're 10 centimeters. She's like, you can start pushing if you want. And I literally, it was the first time that I left that labor land. Um, and I just, I opened my eyes wide and I just laughed. I laughed out loud. And I said, are you kidding me? This is awesome. I could not believe that I was 10 centimeters and I had already gone through transition because I had no fear, no, at any point did I process anything as pain. It was like fun. <laughs> That's so crazy to say, but I just felt so supported and we were just having a good time and I could not believe it. I just felt on top of the world. 
And so I looked at my husband. I was like, "All right, babe." I was like, "Can you um, just give me your hand? I want to go to the. I want to go to the tub." I was like, I really wanted to save the the birth tub for pushing my baby out because I didn't want to tear. I did tear like a little bit with my first. It was like a first degree, but it was awful. I hated it. And so he was like, yeah. So we were like giddy. We were excited, giddy. And oh, poor thing, there was this woman in the room next to me and she was just having a time. Like we were in labor together and she was screaming. And I just remember, I remember feeling like so bad for her and just like feeling like, come on girl, like we are in this together. Like let's have our babies. And uh, so I went into the tub and that's when things got a little real <laughs> because uh, the pressure from having that baby right there and like coming out, I was like, I'm going to tear. I'm going to tear. I'm going to tear. Oh, no, I don't want to tear. I really don't want to tear. I was like, I don't think I can stop myself from pushing this baby out too fast. And I really want to push her out nice and slow so I don't tear. And so I looked at my husband. I was like, baby, I was like, please give me the gas. Can you just get her in here with the gas? And he was like, but you really didn't want gas. And I was like, I know I said I didn't want gas, but I can tell she's like right there. And he was like, no, she is. By the time they get the gas in, like she's already going to be here. He was like, reach down and feel her. And I reached down and I was like, I put my finger in and I was like, there's nothing there. Like, and I looked at him and I said, why did, why would you lie to me? She's not there. I was like, please just get her in here with the gas. So her name was Grace and uh, just the, the girl with the gas. And I just remember saying like, come on, Grace, come on, Grace. So Grace finally got there and I took that first breath of gas and I like just went into this warm ocean. And it wasn't anything like my experience with gas the first time. It was like this warm, floaty ocean in my mind. And there was literally no pain, zero pain, only like warm pleasure. And I know that it just sounds so crazy, but it is true. And I remember hearing like just the cheers of the people around me and like my sisters and my husband was just like, yes. And everything that was being said was like so beautiful and affirming and, and in like slow motion, I remember hearing yes. And, um, then my midwife saying, I see your eyes and there she is. And I remember hearing my sister-in-law just gasp, like she's there. And then I remember hearing Amber reach down, catch your baby. And I could just feel her body leaving mine in like slow motion. And it was painless. And my husband makes fun of me still because I just had the biggest, goofiest smile on my face as I'm like breathing her out with this nitrous. And it just breathed her out. And I reached down between my legs and took the mask off and I'd only breathed the mask for like, you know, two waves. And so I didn't get a lot of, of the nitrous. And as soon as the mask was off, it was like, I was boom, all right there in real time. I reached out between my legs, grabbed her, held her to my chest. And we have this on video. It was so awesome. I literally, I was like, oh my gosh. I was like, that's how God designed birth to be. I was like, I just kept saying that. I was like, that's how God designed birth to be. That was amazing. Oh my gosh. That was amazing. That was perfect. And, you know, something that I had felt, you know, in that moment when her body was like leaving mine was just this whole, you know, I was raised in like Bible Belt of the South and, you know, always taught that painful birth is like part of, Eve's curse over women because of the fruit and all that. And I remember thinking like as she was being born and and this like slow motion time like that that whole curse mindset that was over me was just done with. And I remember feeling like God you love me this much to give me something so beautiful in this moment through everything I've been through in my life like what like I could die now because I'm so happy and I know I am this loved. And I just felt so much love in that moment, like just with my man, my husband and my sisters and then my baby. And it was, oh man, it was absolute euphoria. And 
she was perfect. I got to see her cord, which I didn't with my first. And I just remember I just grabbed onto that cord. I was like, it's amazing. Look at that cord. And she was beautiful. And I just kissed her all over and my husband and I kissed and, and we were all celebrating. And then it was like, all right, let's get out of the tub. So I didn't tear it all. I stood up out of the tub. My midwives helped me to the bed. Um, I delivered my placenta. I did have some hemorrhaging, so I had to get that Pitocin and that side attack again. But I was just on cloud nine. And it was the absolute happiest moment of my life. It just was. It was like heaven. And I couldn't believe it. Like an hour later, I handed over to my husband and my sisters were enjoying her and having some skin to skin. And and I was like, you know what? I'm going to go take a shower. So she was born at 101 a.m. And like 3 a.m., I was standing by myself in this dark shower and just like could not believe, like washing my hair and like washing my face and just like thanking God for that experience. And um, yeah, it really inspired me in that moment. Like I was like, I'm supposed to be in birth. And so I started like, I was like, this is my calling. I have entered into even more intense training to become a doula. And I'm currently working with um, three friends right now. They're, they're delivering in February, April, and May. And so I'm just getting to walk through them with it. And I really believe like any, however you have your baby, um, as long as you like really get to educate yourself and know what your options are, you can have an empowered euphoric birth, no matter how that baby is born. I think it was Jennifer Hirsch who came on your podcast and said, you know, what affects a woman most is not how her baby's born necessarily, but how she feels that she was treated during that experience and and if she feels like she was empowered. And so, yeah, Bren, that's those are my stories. It's amazing. I love just hearing your different tone of voice in the <laughs> yeah. first versus the second. Oh, I could just yeah. picture picture you with that goopy grin that you talked oh, about. Oh, it was, it's like teeth, like front buck teeth, like just hanging out. It's glorious. <laughs> he, yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> Is there anything that you wanted to mention real quickly resources wise? Yeah. So just real quick, I do have a blog. It's handyapron.com. Um, and on that blog, I just talk about marriage, birth, kids. Um, but I've written an article called Coping Tools and Techniques for Fear-Free, Pain-Free Childbirth. And I just list all the tools that I use, um, all the podcasts that I listen to, and just um, how to have that, you know, what tools to keep in your pocket for having a fear-free, pain-free childbirth. And then I just published an article actually this morning called How to Be Your Own Doula. And that's like literally the four session plan that I walk my clients through. And it's, it's, you know, for people who want to be empowered in birth coaching, but don't have the money or just want to have more of an intimate setting with just them and their husband. I mean, it's literally every link to every book, every podcast, um, every, just everything that I, I believe in and use the spinning babies, the mile circuit, just everything is in that article. And then you can find me on Instagram. My Instagram handle is doula Amber. So D O U L A and my name Amber. And, um, I love talking about birth if you can't tell. (laughs) And, um, I, oh yeah. Another big resource. I know I've mentioned it a bunch is your, uh, the birth hours, private Facebook group. Those ladies, um, they are awesome and funny and they care. And if you have a question, like there will always be someone in that group ready to answer and just be there to support you. So, and your podcast has been huge. I still listen (laughs) to it every day if I can. It's crazy how many episodes there are now. I was thinking about that when you said that. I was like, wow, there's going to be enough for like one every day of the year pretty soon. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And they're also good. Like, I listen to them twice. (laughs) So... (laughs) Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm really excited about this How to Be Your Own Doula article because I actually just had someone email me today saying that their friend asked them to be at their birth and she was asking for resources of how to be oh, you know, awesome. kind of an unofficial doula. So I'm going to send this to her, but it seems like a lot of people will get a lot of use out of it. 
Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. My husband definitely took all of that training well, and he rocked it too. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, thank you, Bryn. Now we're going to talk to Jessica about her experience using Aeroflow breast pumps. Hi, Jessica. Thanks for coming on the birth hour today to talk about Aeroflow breast pumps with me. Hi. Can you tell listeners just a little bit about you and your family before we get started? Yeah. um, My name is Jessica, and I'm from Ohio. Uh, I have two little boys, and I'm actually pregnant with my first girl right now. Oh, yay. Congrats. Thank you. Well, tell me about how you heard about Aeroflow and how you got started using them. I actually heard about Aeroflow through just like a random Facebook ad when I was pregnant with my second son. Um, my insurance had had literally just started covering breast pumps, so I was I had been searching them and trying to figure out what the best way to acquire one was via insurance. So when I saw the Aeroflow ad, I thought this seems too good to be true, but I <laughs> filled out the form and went through the whole process, and it was very quick and easy. And I had my I had, that time I got my pump after he was born, but that was just because of my insurance. Um, this time when I ordered it, I got it two days after, literally. Two days after ordering it? Yeah. Wow. Very cool. So Aeroflow is basically just like a middleman that takes care of all of the paperwork and dealing with insurance and stuff. And for you, what was the process like? You just go on their website and fill out what you wanted? Yeah. So um, what I did was they had a form where you were able to give your contact information and then they have a representative reach out to you. Um, the representative calls and emails. So she called me and I didn't answer because I was at work. And so she sent me an email and asked me um, about my OBGYN to get the prescription and what insurance I had. And I gave her that information and she did all the all the work. She contacted my insurance um, she contacted my doctor's office because I'm uh, on TRICARE, so it's through the military, so they're very particular. Um, and she was able to get the prescription and the, with the correct verbiage and get everything to me. And then she sent me a list of approved pumps. I selected the one I wanted, and it was here in two days. That's so awesome. Like you said, sounds too good to be true <laughs> to not have to deal with insurance at all. Yeah, it was incredible. It was a very easy thing to check off of my to-do list. And that's really good to hear for any military families out there listening that that's totally doable with their insurance as well. Yes. Which pump did you choose? Um, The first time I got a Medela pump and style. And then this time I got the Spectra S2. Cool. So you just want to kind of see which one you like better? Yeah, I thought that it would be it would be a good switch up, and I have a another a friend who is also in the military, and she she did the same thing. She had the Medel the first time, and then she switched to the Spectra, and she really recommended it. So I thought I'd give it a try. That's awesome that you can get a new one with each pregnancy, because I know pumps like have a a mileage to them where they aren't as efficient the longer you use them. Right. And since I pumped for nine months the first time, I know that my pump probably isn't as good as it was. So it was really nice to be able to get a brand new one this time. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for telling us about your experience and congratulations again on baby girl. Thank you so much. Thank you so much again to Amber for sharing her story with us and to Jessica for coming on and talking about Aeroflow. Head over to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour and they will seriously take care of everything. It's totally free to you. And I've had a ton of listeners message me about how great of an experience it was. If you want more information from today's episode, just head over to thebirthhour.com and find the show notes page. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.